which is a very warm welcome to the last of the events in this uh, current series of on uh, insiders outsiders related events many of you i suspect will have listened into the rather fascinating and informative talk given by yvonne cresswell just about half an hour ago if so i hope you've had time to catch your breath and uh, i think the two events will work really well together um right i'm going to keep a low profile except for um sort of moving the pictures around as as required but as you will all know the focus for this last session is specifically on the women internees, which I think most of you will agree is an even less explored aspect of the whole internment story than the experiences of the male internees. And um, I will obviously, um, well, I won't give detailed introductions, but I'd like very much, very warmly to welcome the four participants today who very kindly under the, uh, my, under the sort of tutelage, should we say, of David Vertheim, um, it's Pamela Pam Crow and Doreen Moore and Ali Graham, who are all closely involved with the so-called Russian Heritage Trust. Now, for those of you who know something about the topic, you will know that Russian, as in R-U-S-H-E-N, not as in Soviet Union, uh, Russian was the collective name of the two um, areas is the two, two communities in the south of the island, very beautiful part of the island, which house the women in Ternese. And I'm not going to say any more, but I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Doreen, Doreen Moole, to give us an introduction. And I will um, now screen share, Doreen, yes? Um, yes. Okie doke. Um, Okay, good evening. There we go. Good evening. Yes, go ahead. Russian Heritage Trust in the south of the Isle of Man was set up in 2014 with several action teams to preserve the heritage of the south of the Isle of Man. In our internment team, we're not academics, we're not, we've not met before we embarked on this project, and we come from a range of backgrounds. Pam Crow, a businesswoman and retired Manx politician, David Vertheim, an international businessman, Alison Graham, a quantity surveyor, and myself, Doreen Mole, a retired primary school teacher. Our team has researched the World War II internment camp for women and their children, which was set up by the Home Office and the Metropolitan Police with help from the local police force. We found the project fascinating and we've amassed an extensive amount of information. As a result, we've produced two exhibitions with 6,000 visitors and revisitors and a book entitled Friend or Foe. You will hear tonight from some of the team about various aspects of life in the camp, but in the time available, we cannot cover the whole story. There is much more in the book and till, still more that we are continuing to discover. But why was the Isle of Man chosen for the internment camps? When in January 1940 plans were suggested for internment of enemy aliens, Sir John Anderson, the then Home Secretary, declared that there was nowhere in the British Isles sufficiently removed from areas of military importance that could be used to house large numbers of internees. The authorities were reminded by the Manx Chamber of Trade that some 23,000 male internees were housed in the Isle of Man during World War I. As a result, decisions were taken in London to set up internment camps in the island yet again. As this time round there were women and children involved, a separate camp in the southern peninsula of the island was allocated for this purpose and the two villages of Port Erin and Port St Mary, with a population of less than 2,000, became the centre of the location. With most of the men in the community away at war, by Christmas 1940, approximately 80% of the population, and internees plus locals, was female. The first women were brought to the island on board the Belgian cross-channel ferry, Princess Josephine Charlotte but because most of the Manx ferries were away at Dunkirk. They were then taken by train from Douglas to Port Erin and Port St Mary. Once there, they were registered at St Catherine's Church Hall before being taken to their billets in the hotels on the promenade. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. Right, so much for that. Let's just... Mm 
Right. Hold on. Sorry. That's okay. Approximately 3,500 internees and children. It's not clear exactly how many children, which included 300 pregnant women, arrived on the 29th and 30th of May 1940, on the very days that eight of the Manx ferries were helping to rescue 338,000 members of the armed forces from Dunkirk. Three of the Manx ferries were sunk and most of the 45 men who lost their lives were Manxmen, including four from the south of the island. It is a remarkable coincidence that this tragic day for the Isle of Man and for the Manx friends and relatives of those who died was also the day on which the first women internees arrived. Both locals and internees had their own personal problems. It must have been difficult for the landladies of the hotels where the internees were billeted to put their feelings to one side and do as the commandant asked and treat them with kindness. But for the most part, they did. I'll now hand you over to Pam, who will tell you about the two commandants. Pam, are you, are you there? I hope so. Pam? Yes, un 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 there we are. Well done. Welcome. <laughs> oh dear, the technical uh, kind of, uh, yeah, anyway, we, we got there. Lovely. Got to... You see on your screen now a picture of Dame Joanna Cruikshank, who was the first commandant of the Russian internment camp. She volunteered. She was a heroine of World War I. In World War I, she established the Royal RAF Nursing Service, Princess Mary's Royal Air Force Nursing Service. Quite a mouthful. But she managed to build and to manage six hospitals throughout the world. So a woman of great organisational ability. In World War II, she had volunteered and was actually asked to manage all the auxiliary nursing services, the Red Cross and the St. John Ambulance and St. Andrew's Nursing Service. And so she did. And then when a commandant was required, she was the ideal choice. Now, unfortunately, early in her career, she had contacted a very pernicious form of, of malaria. And she was unwell at this time, and the Home Secretary was um, not willing really to formally send a letter to her, but his private secretary asked her unofficially if she would do this kindness, if you like, and so she did. She arrived five days before the 3,500 internees that we've just heard Dory mention arrived. Now amongst them, three hundred pregnant women and also 40 Lutheran deaconess nursing sisters which turned out to be a great boon in the camp for Dame Joanna. Now Dame Joanna saw no difference between race, religion or colour of skin. They were all her patients. She did not distinguish in any way. They were all in her care. And she established a wonderful camp, not only a hospital, an, a, um, a mother and baby home, a maternity clinic, uh, clinics in both Port St. Mary and Port Erin, doctors and dentist clinic. And in fact, the healthcare was said to be better than anyone could get in the United Kingdom at that time. And it was free for the internees, which of course it wasn't for the people in the United Kingdom. Now, the internees, as I say, were her patients and she brooked no nonsense from anyone who wanted to interfere. So she did not have a good reputation amongst the men, like the chief constable and many others who did not actually, in those days, recognize a woman in authority. And even to the extent of Bishop Bell, who was prone to interfere with the running of the camp on an occasion. 
and I'm afraid she did not see that very helpful at all and even threatened to walk out. But I believe that her calm management of the camp was very much down to her Quaker values. And we mentioned again that, as I say, Dame Joanna ran this camp very successfully and a lot of internees will vouch for that. When she had to leave the camp, a letter that was more or less a resignation uh, actually said that how much she was really wishing to leave the camp now. Not only was she unwell, she'd worked so desperately hard during these times, but it, as a true nurse and midwife, the end of her letter to the Home Office actually mentioned that unexpectedly that evening a baby had been delivered. Now I don't know, she was a skilled midwife, whether she delivered the baby or not, but I thought it was a charming touch at the end of the letter. Now on the other hand we have the gentleman that took over from Dame Joanna and that was Cyril Roy Cuthbert. He himself promoted himself to be the camp commandant of the married camp. He was on the island as he had asked to be relocated from London. Um, he was the secretary to the Bow Street Tribunal, so had a great knowledge of the tri how the tribunals worked. And of course, the tribunals were desperately needed in the island. So he um, put in a request to be transferred to the island, and he came with his wife, who was a land girl, and he um, settled in Douglas. But he was a great man for spotting an opportunity, as he did throughout his police career. And he spotted the opportunity for the post of commandant of the married camp. Although, of course, Dame Joanna's deputy, Miss Wilson, was the obvious choice for the camp. She'd actually set up the married women's camp. However, he placed himself in the right position. He, tell her he wrote to the Home Office, and as usual, <laughs> <laughs> he was in the right place at the right time and he became the commandant. His, he, he was a great hit with the landladies and my mother-in-law even commented on his film star looks. So he, he was a great favourite amongst the landladies and after the uh, highly organised authoritarian regime of Dame Joanna, I'm sure um, Mr. Cuthbert was a very welcome relief release. Um, but he ran the camp and during that time, he compiled a report, which has been very much dwelt on in some academic papers I've read. But when I saw it in more detail, what had happened was he had cut out all the newspaper cuttings from the time the camp began and he pasted them into a journal and it was known as the Cuthbert Report. And in fact, he sent a copy to the Home Office. And I've seen the reply in the National Archives from the Home Office to say, well, it was very kind of him to send this report, but it hasn't, hadn't been requested. And they didn't actually know what it was, for, what it was about. However, Cuthbert was disciplined on more than one occasion for his alteration of the Home Office orders. He insisted on changing the orders where it said internees into aliens. And this was very much disapproved of by the Home Office. And I have seen the letters commenting on this with a note of disapproval. But however, he was well liked. He kept the camp going. Of course, at that time he was commandant. There was a quarter of the internees in the camp. It was not as when Dame Joanna arrived, the chaos of 3,500 ladies all arriving, who were all accommodated by nightfall in one day. I think even today we would have difficulty in doing that. So there is my comparison of the two commandants, one who I, I think had a rather easier time than the other. I'm now going to hand over to my other friend in our team, Alison Graham, who's going to talk 
to you about the Metropolitan Police. Right, thank you, Pam. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a sad fact that most young, most of the youth appear to have no interest in what their parents or grandparents did when they were young. I'm as guilty and often say, why didn't I ask mum about her experiences when she was young? My grandmother, a widow with five children at the time of the arrival of the internees, housed 22 women in the boarding house that she ran on Portsmouth Promenade. Mum explained, being young children, we didn't fully understand why these people would be staying in our homes and being considered the enemy, we were fearful we would be murdered in our beds. This fear was dispelled pretty quickly when they found themselves being bathed, had their clothes knitted for them and were even taught some German by their, um, oh, I've lost my place, uh, or by their unexpected guests. Uh, Mum later only spoke in high regard for these displaced people, particularly when their home again became a camp for married couples. Mum recalled a Mr and Mrs Yoster who were interned with them, regardless of the fact that they had lived in England for many, many years. I'm still hoping to follow up on the relatives of these internees if I can continue my research. They had unfortunately never taken out naturalisation papers and there was no leeway where documents were concerned, no matter where loyalties lay. And this was compounded by the fact that they had sons fighting in the British Army. So when the War Cabinet decided that the Alaman would uh, form a camp for women and children, which should be operated by the Home Office and civilians rather than military, they considered women police would be more suitable for keeping order in the camp. The problem was there were no women in the Manx police force until 1950. So the Alman requested that the Met in London could lend them some women police constables and there was no shortage of volunteers. Their duties would be mainly custody and es escort of the internees. Five WPCs came to the island accompanied by a woman superintendent called Miss Pito. It was interesting that in Miss Pito's unpublished memoirs, she referred to the Russian camp as a detention centre uh, and may have been briefed that it would be short term only, which for many internees turned out to be the case as a large number were released back to the UK over the first 12 months of the camp. The rules of the camp were pinned on the inside of the internees doors. Pam actually managed to obtain an original copy of these, which had been kept by one of the internees. Curfews, shopping twice a week, access to most areas within the camp boundary and the beaches. The WPCs escorted those who wished to travel between the two villages to meet up with friends or go to the cinema. They were escorted to work on the farms and the local fish factory and some of the WPCs joined them uh, in some of the work on the farm. Uh, I received a letter from an archivist at the Metropolitan Women's Police Association written by a Sergeant Ivy Baxter. I've got a little picture, I hope everybody might be able to see it. I don't know if we can pop it up. If I can pull it out. We've got um, three WPCs. We've got uh, Ivy who's in the white shirt and the hat. We've got um, the station master and his assistant and we've got also a, a female internee right at the very bottom, the bottom left. They, they, their job here would be, they're at, actually on the um, train station, they would be actually checking luggage and I would imagine the internee was probably there to help them um, as an interpreter, I would think. So I hope you're able to see that all right. Um, so as Ivy Baxter, um, her letter uh, gave me a very in, a good, an insight into the experiences of the women police. Some of the first WPCs wanted to return to London as they found the island too quiet. Uh, the replacements remaining until the camp closed in September 1945. Those who returned to London would have experienced the intense bombing in stark contrast to the relative safety of the island. Misdemeanours within the camp were few, confined mainly to petty theft. They would either be fined or jailed for a short period. Um, I researched many of the local newspapers of the time. A young internee who had a baby unfortunately stole a ring from a fellow internee who spotted her wearing it. 
In court, she admitted taking the ring to give her some means to live by when she got back to England. Uh, these were a mix of, there was a mix of very wealthy and extremely poor. Some were destitute. And as David will cover later, for this reason, a currency for all was introduced with the service exchange. Um, we had the pleasure of interviewing a 100 year old lady called Mona Quillen, who lived next door to my grandmother in Port Mary. She billeted 11 internees and we asked her if she'd experienced any problems with any of her internees. Initially, both Mona and her sister were fearful during the months that saw Hitler moving towards an invasion of England. As some of the younger internees had told them, Hitler would, will be in the Tower of London by Christmas. Mona said, you had to be careful at that time what you said, but when the tide turned, we were able to relax. There was fear amongst all involved in this situation. Her story is both sad and humorous, and an intelligent, an Italian male internee with them during the married camp years worked on a farm and always came back with a pocket full of eggs. Householders were advised to remove and store items that the authorities would not replace. They had taken up the stair carpet and the timber runners and stored them in the attic. When the time came to put them back, they discovered all the timber rods had disappeared. They later found out that the Italian internee had over the months, converted the timber rods into toggle buttons and had sold them all. After some months on compassionate grounds, the authorities realized that married internees in separate camps should be permitted to meet up. And I found a passage in Miss Pito's memoirs, particularly emotionally charged. She wrote, one of the real hardships of the camps was the segregation of husbands and wives in different parts of the island. I have a vivid recollection of the great day when a meeting was arranged in Port St. Mary. The women were brought from Port Erin to a large hotel at the end of Port St. Mary Promenade to await the arrival of their menfolk. At last, a large body of men came into view at the farther end of the promenade, escorted by guards. It was a moving sight in both senses of the word. As they advanced, the orderly procession quickened pace until the whole party were racing along the seafront with arms outstretched to greet their wives and families. Happily, married quarters were arranged shortly afterwards at Port St Mary for families who were reunited once more. So just to conclude, our, our book had to be condensed. So much is still to be written from our research and we hope to continue to add to this. And with that, I'll hand you back to Doreen for the next chapter. Thank you. It was education for uh, all. Give me a minute. I'm sorry. For some reason, this PowerPoint is sticking, which is not what we need. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. There we go. Oops. Oh, can I say? Is that the one? Yes. Doreen, is this the image? Yes, it yes, is. Yes, that's the one. Yes. Right. There was education for all. The summer 1940 was hot, and the children were able to enjoy their time on the beach. But it soon became obvious that the children needed some structure to their lives. A number of internees approached the Commandant about setting up a school. On issues concerning children, Jane, Dame Joanna was always helpful. And so initially, two kindergartens were established, one at the clubhouse at Rowney Golf Club, Port Erin, and the other at the rear of Cowley's Cafe, a former boys' school in Port St Mary, it's seen here on the... Uh, PowerPoint. Although open all day, demand was high, so children either attended in the mornings or in the afternoons. In Port Erin, there were nine classes of six to 14 year olds in the schoolroom at Dandy Hill Chapel, but as numbers increased, they moved to the rear of the Strand Cafe. Next slide, please. Um, in October 1940, where the head teacher was Dr. Ingeborg Gerland, a former lecturer at Durham University. Meanwhile, in Port St. Mary, when the children left the kindergarten aged six, they attended school across the road at the Cornet boarding house until they were 16. At 16, they ceased to be children and attended a tribunal in Douglas before officially becoming internees. In January 1941, 
after her official visit to the camp, Theo Naftal of the International Cooperative Women's Guild Committee said in her report that the schooling had had beneficial effects on the children. She said they loved school and are much brighter and less nervy since they have not been in such constant contact with the adult life in the hotels. Erna Nelke, an interned teacher, psychologist and socialist, also approved of the provision made for the children. In an article in The Independent, Labour Party's new leader in 1941, she said, the outlook of the majority of the refugees on the Isle of Man is anti-German. The children often refused to speak German. Most of them wanted an English school with an English curriculum and English ideals. We tried to give them that, but for those who were willing to play their part in building up a new free Germany, we tried to give the knowledge which will help them in that task. The children were being prepared for their future, whether that would be in England or in Germany. The biggest threat to morale among the internees was boredom. But many of them were well educated and had considerable skills. So the women soon organized a wide range of activities and courses. In Port St. Mary, there were 30 different courses, including Greek, German literature, British history, reading Shakespeare, problems of life and mathematical training, plus practical skills such as glove making and shorthand. Let me see the next slide. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. We tested it. Oh, no. <laughs> don't worry, it's okay. Fine, why is it sticking? Hold on, somebody else needs to get in. Let's try again. There we go. Yes, okay. is that the Yes. In Port Erin, there were 17 different, more different, more practical courses, including weaving, dressmaking, spinning, music appreciation, and a small orchestra. Many of these courses took place in Collinson's Cafe, which was also a meeting place for the women to socialize. A third venue at Dandy Hill Schoolroom offered a further 13 courses on English, Swedish, philosophy, European history, shorthand, Faust, Russian, French, Latin, psychology, phonetics, Spanish, and Italian. So a very wide selection. In addition to the courses, 40 of the internees were registered at the Marine Biological Station, where they carried out research and gave lectures to other women who were suitably qualified. All these women were permitted to use the quiet room and the library. And in return, they reorganized and cataloged several thousand papers on marine biological and hydrographical topics. Many books were supplied by both individuals and charitable organizations. Ruth Michaelis Jenner, who had been a bookseller in Scotland, was asked to organize the books into a proper library at Collinson's Cafe, and she enjoyed the opportunity to do so. The library was a huge success with hundreds of readers and a constant supply of books. Half of the teachers were over 35 years old and very experienced, and some had outstanding qualifications, so the quality of education was high. However, by mid-1941, 80% of these women had been released, and many of the courses had been curtailed. So for some of the remaining internees, boredom may have set in again. It is to be hoped that their newfound skills stayed with them and made their lives more bearable. Next slide, please. Mm. Thank you. One teacher who made a considerable contribution to the education in the camp in Port St. Mary was Minna Specht. Forgive my German pronunciations here, please. Born in Germany in 1879, she was educated in a small private school in Bergedorf and later trained as a teacher at a convent school in Hamburg. For a while she worked as a governess, but in 1902 she was invited to teach at a new girls' school in Hamburg. It was there that she discovered a love for teaching. In 1933, she was teaching at the Valkenmuller School near Kassel. However, the school was closed early in 1933 because Minna, as head teacher, would not adhere to Hitler's idea of a military education. She fled with some of the pupils to Denmark, 
where she established a school for German emigres. In 1938, when the situation in Denmark changed, she left for Wales and later Bristol, where she was arrested. She was interned in May 1940, but her public opposition to the Nazis led, her to led to her release after one year. Minna, along with many of the other teachers in the camp, had been affected by their experiences. So, after her release, she worked in London with young people who had been brought up. She worked in London with young people who had brought up with Nazism and whose lives had been shattered by the war. In autumn 1945, she was the only German to be invited to Zurich for a conference about these children. There she was invited to be the head of a progressive boarding school, Odenwaldschule, which had had to close in 1934. She ran the school from 1946 until 1951. She became a member of the German Commission for UNESCO and associate of the Educational Institute of UNESCO in Hamburg. In this role, she worked to progress the methods of an experiential learning established by Maria Montessori. As an inspector of schools in 1955, she received the Goethe Platt for training and education for her service in educational science, theory and practice. Her focus was self-determination and self-discipline. She died in 1964 in Bremen. After Minna's death, a community primary school bearing her name was established in 1964 in the Schwanheim district of Frankfurt. An interesting lady. I will now hand you over to David, who will tell you about Ruth Borchard and the service exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Doreen. Um, one of the things that I think is extremely interesting in uh, our study of the uh, internees in the Russian internment camp is the fact that um, they were uh, from disparate backgrounds, um, interacted for quite a short period of time, and then uh, went away again. And one of the, excuse me, I'm having difficulty getting the video to stay on. Yes, you're currently invisible, which is a shame. <laughs> Each time I switch it on, it switches off. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll keep talking anyway. Talking, uh, you were visible for a minute. Um, second. This must be very irritating for people. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about Ruth Borchard, um, who was born in uh, uh, near to Hamburg on the North Sea coast in 1910. Um, her father, Robert uh, Berenson, was a businessman. She was the eldest of four children, and she was um, brought up uh, as a socialist. Um, she went to the uh, University of Hamburg to study uh, economics and social psychology, spent a year in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, and returned to complete her doctorate. Uh, in 1937, uh, she, managed, she married uh, Kurt Warchard, whose family had a shipping business in Hamburg. And in 1938, they emigrated to England uh, and moved to Reigate in Surrey. In May 1940, um, they were both interned and um, Ruth was sent first of all to Holloway and then on to the Isle of Man together with her uh, eldest daughter, Catherine. Um, by Christmas 1940, she was living in the Golf Links Hotel. And uh, the, by that time already, five of the seven people in their group had been released and she together with the the other lady who was left behind wrote the following short uh i suppose poem uh which is part of a contribution the so-called illustrated roll call of 70 the internees to their landlady for christmas and and they wrote seven nice ladies sitting near a wall as five nice ladies received the release call there were two nice ladies left lonely near a wall. 
And we two are ladies are waiting for that call so that we'll be released after all. But she, wanted, she wasn't released for quite some considerable time. Um, she had already in September 1940 identified uh, that um, one of the things that uh, perhaps she could contribute to the camp uh, to relieve the uh, inevitable boredom that uh, was, was impacting the lives of the internees uh, was the establishment of what was, became the service exchange. Uh, by the way, can everybody hear me? Because I cannot see any sign of my visibility on the screen. It's fine, David. You are visible and you're well audible. Okay, very good. Thank you. I just wanted to check. No, no, fine. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, the, this, the, the concept of this was uh, very simply a system whereby uh, internees having to, not having to do everything for themselves, they did, they did what they were good at and would then exchange their goods and services uh, with others through a medium of exchange, uh, which was established through a token system. Uh, it was truly following the, the principle popular, popularized by Karl Marx, jedem nach seinen Fähigkeit, jedem nach seinen Bedürfnissen, or in other words, to each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Um, it's, the, the idea was uh, successfully sold uh, by uh, Ruth, first of all to Margaret Collier, one of the um, uh, Quaker volunteers who'd arrived at the start of the camp and had remained at the quest, request of Bertha Bracey, the, the leading Quaker um, volunteer who'd had a significant in, involvement with the establishment of the camp. Uh, and th th that in then was in turn um, uh, used to convince the command commandant Joanna Cruikshank. Uh, so subsequently, uh, Ruth described the uh, service exchange extensively in an article in the Manchester Guardian in 1942 after her release. And actually, she wrote a paper on it um, and talked about it as, as simply a, a centrally planned allocation of labor specialization. It was based on cardboard tokens. It took two months to set up. It involved at the peak 1,200 of the internees. And as we've already heard, there were about three and a half thousand at the peak. Um, they were involved. So it's about a third of the internees became involved. Sewing, clothing, handicrafts, gardening, glove making. Um, towards Christmas 1940, because this had been established in October, um, demand started to exceed supply. Um, so there was something of an inflationary uh, effect. Um, the values restabilized in January 1940 and the tokens, which they'd made by cutting up uh, cereal packages, um, were then uh, st were stabilized by, for the rest of the period that the service exchange uh, existed. Uh, which was about 15 months in, t in total to late 1941. Uh, it broke down as a result, as we've already heard, of the internees as being released. And so there was just not enough labor to be able to keep the, um, the uh, service exchange going. Ruth concluded her report in the Manchester Guardian that compared with enforced uh, idleness, it was a great deal. Uh, and she goes on to say, as an experiment in a centrally planned economy, it showed that it can work owing to the virtually unlimited adaptability of human nature, but mainly it was a lesson in the difficulties involved. So there we have an economist and a, 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 a socialist uh, inventing a monetary system and a centrally planned economy for the camp and I'm sure she did regard it as an experiment because um, after her release, um, she actually became a professional economist in London at the London School of Economics, working to, for as an assistant to Friedrich Hayek, who was later a Nobel Prize winner after he'd moved to the University of Chicago for his work on free market economics. 
Um, she was indeed a polymath because she was an extensive author. She wrote children's uh, books. She wrote biographies, notably a biography of John Stuart Mill, the economist. She wrote poetry, uh, rather better, I hope, than the dog roll in the uh, illustrated roll call. Uh, she wrote historical and crime novels and books on mysticism. Um, one thing that was in incomplete and in fact unpublished until only a few years ago was an autobiographical novel uh, entitled uh, We Are Strangers Here and it actually describes her uh, arrest, uh, the period of time that she was in Holloway and uh, her shipment to the Isle of Man but rather frustratingly and annoyingly it ends with her arrival in Port St Mary. Um, she became uh, a significant art collector. Uh, early in the 1950s, she decided that she, would be, she was interested in self-portraits, and so she started to collect self-portraits by British artists, setting a ceiling price, rather optimistically, of 20 guineas. Um, between 1958 and 1971, she was actually very successful in persuading the artists to part with their self-portraits and created a, an art collection of a hundred self-portraits, many of which by, were by very significant British artists of the period. Um, and that's now been established as a Ruth Borchard collection. There is a monograph on it by, by Philip Van, which I understand is being republished. A uh, biannual prize exists and uh, coincidentally, that exhibition uh, only a few weeks ago came to the Isle of Man where it is being shown uh, to the Isle of Man public. Um, so that's the story of Ruth Borchard. Um, I will now hand over to the next speaker, which is in fact Doreen again. Thank you, David. Oh, is that the one you want or is it the one before? It's um, the one before, please. This one or the one before that? That's it. That's lovely. Thank you. Right. A considerable amount has been written about the music in the men's camps in the Isle of Man during World War II. And indeed, there were many professional musicians in turn there. However, there was as much musical prowess in the women's camp in Russian. In most of the hotel lounges, there were pianos, and the lounges themselves were large rooms designed for dances and concerts. So it was not long before a range of musical activities began to develop. It soon became apparent that many of the instrumental musicians had managed to bring their instruments with them, and this added to the range of available activities. There were a number of professional opera singers and many enthusiastic amateurs. The church halls also became venues for events when larger audiences needed to be accommodated and many of the musicians took a regular part in nearby church services as recorded by local newspapers. At first the internees were not allowed to visit other hotels so musical groups developed in a number of places and some overlapped when they rehearsed in church halls etc. Much of the music performed was by German and Austrian composers, including Schubert, Strauss, Handel, Bach and Beethoven. But there were also performances of Manx and English folk songs. In addition to these performances, there were several Christmas events, puppet shows for the children, a Viennese evening, an evening of ballet and a number of variety shows written by the internees. An original programme for one of musical evenings still exists and is in the safekeeping of the Isle of Man collection at the Leo Beck Institute in New York. The programme was acquired by them as part of the effects of Martha Volgast. Martha was responsible for compiling the programme. It was a successful programme of songs, poems and music on the evening of the 6th of July 1940, only five weeks after the internees arrived in Russia. One important musician in, in the camp was the lady seen here, Edith Bach Kaczynski. Although it is not clear how active a role she played in any of the groups or events. Edith Bach was born in 1896 and at the height of her career, she was known as the Nightingale of Konigs Wusterhausen. 
She came from a musical family and was a coloratura soprano, soprano in pre-war Berlin, performing all over Europe. On the 22nd of December, 1920, the first transmission of music and speech was made from the Koenig's Wusterha Wusterhausen transmitter. Edith was a director of the radio company and her singing was the first to be transmitted to England from Germany. Weekly concerts would be broadcast to the UK and Edith was noted regularly in the BBC radio supplement. The rise of Nazism, however, meant that by 1935, Edith was banned from performing, simply for being Jewish. She married into the Kaczynski family, but after Kristallnacht, her husband was arrested and transported to Sachsenhaus and concentration camp. Edith escaped to England with her two small boys, William, aged four, and Edward, a baby. Edward had been damaged at birth by lack of medical attention. They were fortunate in being able to obtain a work permit for her husband as a milliner, and he was freed from the concentration camp. Reunited, they began a new life in England. Their reunion, alas, was brief. They were swept up in the paranoia of Collar the Lot and ended up in the Isle of Man in separate internment camps. However, they were eventually reunited in Russian married camp. No records show Edith as having performed in the camp's entertainment world, though she did give singing lessons as a diploma teacher. When her injured baby son Edward first moved his paralysed arm, Edith was so overjoyed she had a message posted around the camp that she would now give free singing lessons. After the war, when Edith was in her late 40s, she tried to restart her singing career by contacting the BBC, but it was not to be. There was no interest. She resigned herself to a role as wife and mother, helping her husband in his millinery business and giving concerts for charity in her community. She still enjoyed her singing. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, I'm so sorry about this. I don't know what... Okay, thank you. The family was sad that they had no recordings of her voice and none could be found. But her sons have recently been overjoyed to discover that a record does exist, De Rosa Sarenfan, and have, been, have given a DVD to Russian Heritage Trust, com combined with a scrapbook of her appearances at the height of her fame. This will make the sound of the Nightingale of Koenig's Busterhaus and ring out once again. Also, a university house in the town has been named after her, so her memory will now be perpetuated. Our research has shown that music and entertainment played a huge and very important role in the lives of the internees and helped to sustain them through some very difficult times. For some women, creative writing was also a way of coming to terms with their situation. One such woman was Mary Neurath. This is Mary. Born Mary Reidemeister in 1898 in Germany, she had in March 1925 gone to work as Otto Neurath's assistant in what had been a small museum of information about housing. But at the beginning of 1925, it had become the Social and Economic Museum of Vienna. In 1935, they began to use the acronym Isotope, Isotype, International System of Typographical Picture Education for their work on demonstrating biological, social, historical, and technological connections pictorially. In 1941, after their release from internment, Mary and Otto were married and resumed work in Oxford, founding the Isotype Institute. After Otto's death in 1945, Mary continued their work with a small number of English assistants, and in 1948 she moved to London. She ded dedicated her time to establishing a record of Otto's life and work, editing and translating his writings. In 1971, Mary retired and gave all the work from their research project to the University of Reading, 
where it can be found in the Department of Typography and Graphic Communication. While Mary was in Russian internment camp, she was one of the people teaching the children and running courses for the adults. After Otto's death, she developed the work of the isotype in a new and influential direction with her series of books published by Max Parrish, which were based on a deep understanding of how children conceptualize the world. Some of you may recognize them from your classroom libraries of the 1950s and 60s. Today, they are very collectible. One series that she wrote was called The Visual History of Mankind, which was intended to help young children to have a clearer picture of how different periods of history developed. One title of many was They Lived Like This in Ancient Mexico. Other books explained how things worked that were not obvious to the naked eye, such as the workings and layout of the London Underground in a book called Railways Under London. There were also books about science, which was then known as Nature Study, including Too Small to See and Strange Plants. Mary Neurath died in London in October 1986, aged 88. I will now hand you over to David, who will talk to you about the artists in the camp. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, the um, situation with regard to artists uh, is very different in the Russian camp than that that existed in the men's camps in, uh, in the Isle of Man. Uh, a lot is known about the artists in the, in the men's camps and a number of them were very significant artists. Uh, in particular, obviously, Kurt Schwitters, uh, and also Ludwig Meidner. Um, the, as far as we can tell uh, from the work that we've done, there are only three uh, professional artists who were uh, interned in the Russian camp. Uh, they were all German, not Austrian in other words. All were sculptors. Two were Jewish and one wasn't Jewish. Um, there were also some amateur artists, but uh, even less is known about them. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about each of those three artists. I will spend rather more time on the first one, Margot Eta Klopfleisch, um, who was born in Dresden. Uh, her father was a cabinet maker, who served in the First World War, um, but they were struggling to make a living. Her mother, her mother had been an amateur opera singer, but was forced to go and work in a bottling plant and died when uh, uh, Margareta Gretel was 14 years old. So uh, Gretel had to go out uh, and work for a living. Um, she was strongly left wing. Uh, she'd been brought up to be a socialist, but um, actually became more and more uh, under the influence of communism. Uh, she played, uh, she taught herself to um, play the violin and was work, uh, playing in a, in a band uh, an agate prop band, and then became um, a member of the Rota Gewerkschafts Internationale, the, um, uh, the, Mo the Moscow directed uh, body that uh, was seeking to influence the trade unions internationally. Um, when she was about 17 years old, she became interested in art and she was modeling for um, the life classes at the Dresden Academy where. Otto Dix was teaching. Um, uh, she actually asked Otto Dix what it would take to become an artist and he said just pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and start drawing, uh, which was a very pragmatic approach. Um, through her uh, uh, communist activities she met uh, her future husband Peter Kopfleisch. In May 1933 Peter had to flee uh, to Czechoslovakia uh, and um, Gretel soon followed when an arrest warrant was issued for her. Um, they couldn't work in, uh, in Czechoslovakia and so they suffered uh, considerable privation, but eventually Gretel uh, found an art teacher who then introduced her to a sculptor and she, so she started to learn to sculpt. 
Um, with the German occupation, they had to flee again. Um, Gretel certainly had no uh, proper papers, only an identity card issued in Prague. And um, on the 4th of March, 1939, she left on the last train, uh, which was heading for, first of all, Finland and then Sweden. And ultimately she arrived in England on the 9th of March. Peter quite separately uh, reached England on the 15th of May, escaping via Poland and Sweden. Uh, she was working as a, a, as a domestic help for Roland Penrose, who helped her educationally. Um, she and Peter married in June, and they moved to Maidenhead. Uh, in, of course, in May 1940, they were both arrested and interned. Gretel, first of all, in Holloway, by which time she was pregnant, but sadly suffered a miscarriage, which wasn't properly treated, by the time she arrived on the 30th of May in Port Erin, uh, was um, suffering from, from a hemorrhage. Uh, she almost died, um, but was, did receive an emergency medical attention and emergency operation. And it was probably soon after that that she produced the uh, plasticine version on the left of despair. Uh, I think those of you who are familiar with the work of Kate Colvitz will see a strong influence. And the teacher who she'd had in Prague had been a close friend of Kate Colvitz. Um, Peter was shipped to Australia on the infamous Denera and was uh, interned in the Hay Camp in New South Wales, uh, but was subsequently returned and re-interned in the United Kingdom. Uh, they were reunited uh, uh, in 1942 and moved to Maidenhead. Um, but in 1950, uh, applied to um, go to the, um, uh, the DDR, the Eastern, Eastern German um, uh, Republic, uh, but were refused entry after two and a half years. Uh, I understand that the um, DDR was very skeptical of people who'd been, um, uh, who'd been in the UK. Um, they were um, ill-advised, well, they were not advised. In fact, the, her brother made a, a clandestine trip to in England and advised them not to go to Eastern Germany. Uh, but um, uh, greatly ignored that. And in 1960, uh, took a vacation there with both of her daughters. Um, their British passports were confiscated. So effectively, they were made prisoners in Eastern Germany. Uh, and they were, not, uh, they, were not, they were never reissued with passports during Gretel's life. Uh, subsequently, her daughter was able to get um, a British passport, her elder daughter, uh, and was able to return to England. So that's the story of Gretel Klopfleisch. Not a very, not a very happy one, I'm afraid. Um, the second artist, Pamina Liebert Marenholz. Um, if we could move on to the to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. Uh, it was born in Berlin. Her father was a lawyer, and you might ask, why was she um, uh, named Pamina? Um, well, it was, in fact, her father was an opera lover and especially liked Mozart, so the connection was fairly obvious. Um, she um, trained at the Berlin Royal Academy under uh, Professor Fritz Klimsch. And uh, in 1929, at the age of 25, she married uh, portrait photographer Rolf Marenholz. Um, she was clearly highly talented and was awarded the Academy Prix de Rome in 1932, but was blocked in her acceptance by the Nazis because she was Jewish. Rolf emigrated in 1938 to Britain and Pamina followed in June 1939. Um, by 1940, um, they were arrested and, um, excuse me. Um, and in 19, so, so she was arrested and uh, went to Holloway, uh, where she um, is reported to have produced sculpture from bread, rather similar to uh, Kurt Schwitter's porridge sculptures in Hutchinson Square. Um, 
So in July 1940, she was shipped to the Isle of Man, um, in, and where she stayed until September 1942, when she was released. Um, afterwards, working first of all in a lampshade factory, undertaking China restoration, and it wasn't until 1946 that she began painting um, and continued painting for the rest of her life. The third artist was Erna Nonnemacher, born in 1889, so rather older. Um, she was born Erna Rosenberg, also in Berlin, was a student at the um, Reimann Schule. Could we go back to the previous slide, please? Um, and then the Kunstgewerbe Schule, um, and um, then studied ceramics at the ceramic school in Bunslau. In 1919, she married a fellow sculptor, Hermann Nonnenmacher, um, and she worked as a, as a modeler for both the Frauenrat and Rosenthal porcelain factories. Uh, she actually uh, modeled um, porcelain sculpture. Um, now, by 1938, um, both of them were classified as Antarctica, i.e. De degenerate artists, and decided to emigrate to London. The Nazis rather graciously uh, offered Hermann the opportunity to stay, because he was not Jewish, so long as he would divorce Anna. Um, he decided that that was not an option he wanted to accept. So they went to, went to uh, they arrived in London, uh, and we're already by 1939 showing under the auspices of the Free German League. Um, about that time, um, 1940, uh, this is when this picture was taken and um, you'll see that they were uh, moving a studio or their studio, joint studio. Uh, I think it's interesting that it was on a horse-drawn cart because obviously there was a shortage of petrol at the time. So. Um, more, um, more uh, substantial uh, move, moving systems were available. Um, the, uh, they were then interned, Erna, uh, first of all in Holloway and then in Russian camp, um, Hermann in the Onken camp. Um, and uh, during that time, can we move forward now to the next slide, please? And then the next slide. Um, during that, there's not, there's not um, really any evidence of uh, Erna's work during the period, except for this one piece, which is a fired tile, uh, which was um, fired on the Isle of Man at the Glen Faber. Um, can we move to the other side of the tile, please? Um, at the Glen Faber um, uh, 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 brickworks. Um, and this is actually in the, the Manx Museum. So it's clear that, that Erna was working in the camp um, and it's possible that she was also teaching art in the camp. They both taught art after they went to London and in 1964, Erna was nominated to the Royal Society of British Sculptors. Um, with that, let me hand back to Doreen. Thank you, David. Well, I hope that between us, we've given you a small taste of what life was like in the Russian internment camp for women and children. And if you'd like to know more, perhaps you would like to read our book. I do hope too, that we've shared just a hint of our enthusiasm for the research we've done and are continuing to do with encouragement from a number of the descendants of internees and their families. Post-war, many of the internees returned to the island year after year for their holidays and have fond memories of time spent here. I will leave you with words from Commandant Cyril Cuthbert. Having reflected on his time as the camp commandant, Inspector Cyril Cuthbert prepared a report dated 1947 covering his time in Russian camp. And he wrote, the regime there had been a humane one with internees being treated in no way as suspected persons, but only as human beings, temporarily detained because of external circumstances over which they had no control. My earnest hope is that it will never be necessary to again effect an internment policy for women, children and families. 
but should it be necessary, Her Majesty's Government can do little better than repeat what was accomplished at Port Erin and Port St Mary on the Isle of Man from 1940 to 1945. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. That was absolutely fascinating, as I'm sure the assembled company will agree. I've been vetting the uh, the chat function. If anybody else has anything they'd like to ask or comment on, please continue to do so. Um, I think we've got time and energy. I think, yes, we must have a few uh, sort of contributions from, from the people listening in. Um, perhaps a very basic question, um, just to kind of clarify the situation from, from somebody called Rachel. What exactly were the criteria for women to be interned on the Isle of Man in the first place? Because that is a very sort of basic, sort of elementary kind of question. I don't know who'd like to tackle it. Well, the, <laughs> any, any foreign national that uh, was living in Britain at the time, anyone that was um, a, a foreign national of an enemy country was interned. Um, it was not considered necessary by the Home Secretary of the time, but Churchill, in a moment of frustration, uh, made that famous announcement, "Color the lot. And so women um, with children, <laughs> or without in fact, were, were all collared in, in a, what was a, a quite unnecessary uh, um, sweeping up of every foreign national that was in the United Kingdom when, when war had been declared. Could I clarify that, please? This is David. It was actually the Category B women um, who were uh, identified for internment. Um, category A were, de were dealt with separately. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Some of the women uh, in the camp were uh, rather peculiarly uh, recategorized as category A, and I believe that Ruth Borchard was one of those, whether it was something to do with the fact that they, they, they had an involvement or her husband had an involvement in a shipping company. But I, I understand from the family, it was rather mystified them why she was categorized, recategorized from B to A. But it was basically the category B women, I think, there was an age range given of 16 to 60, but we, we well know that those ages were not always adhered to and people, un, uh, certainly in the me amongst the men, people under the age of six, 16 were arrested and people over the age of 60. I was just oh, gonna say, Rachel, yes. Rachel popped up there and she said uh, her grandparents were, were not interned. So what David was just saying there, I just, I would assume it's because of their age, uh, Rachel. That's probably why they were not interned. Age, well, well, or maybe not categorised as, as, as B, uh, were categorised as C. David, do you think we should again just step back slightly and just very briefly you tell us what the different categories signified for those who don't know? Uh, well, I hope I can remember this off the top <laughs> of my head. Uh, the, tribu the tribunals uh, were... The, initially in 1939, um, those people who were identified uh, by MI5 as being true Nazis, now I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure what criteria they did use, but they, there were about 560 people identified, this was men, I don't, as far as I know, identified as being strong Nazi sympathizers, and they were categorized as a, um, the, uh, but under the tribunal system, uh, but the tribunal system um, then introduced category B and category C, uh, and categ category B, there were about 6,000 men, I don't know the number for women, under the, under the cat category B, but I guess it must have been somewhere between three and a half or 4,000, um, and then the category C were the rest, and category B were of un 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 uncertain uh, regions. Category C was seen as relatively uh, um, uh, innocuous, but of course when, as Pam has said, when the call of the lot uh, um, announcement came in, uh, category C were also listed and interned. Yes, it is confusing, but I think important to be aware of that kind of uh, background, indeed. Um, apropos age, I've got a question here from Gabby Brown. Um, in relation to the... Uh, no, hold on, sorry. Uh, where's it gone? 
Yes, here we are. Do you, do, you, do you know the age of the youngest solo internee? I have letters from my aunt, who was only 16 at the time, to her mother, who was not interned, as she had Puerto Rican nationality. Was 16, in fact, the very youngest? No, I don't think so. I think we had certainly had younger children than that in turn. As Doreen was mentioning, we had a high school where... Yes, the I, yeah, because I, because I'm going to interrupt. So my aunt was interned without her parents or without any other family members. Yes, I think we're talking about young adults who are interned mm. as themselves, as it were, as opposed to being the children of internees. The youngest would have, the youngest of them would, would have, excuse me, would have been classi classified as internees, would have been 16. Mm. Mm. Uh, or younger than that, they were classified as children. Mm. So if she was 16, whether, why she was, a, a, you know, sort of on her own, you say that her, her mother had... Um, so it, it was a, her, her parents were divorced and her, um, her mother and stepfather had acquired Costa Rican nationality from the, ah, Viennese, yes. from the Costa Rican embassy in Vienna for a certain sum. They'd never been to Costa Rica. Well, Chris... Uh, Costa Rica was a friendly uh, nation. Right, yes. Chris, who came over for a, a ballet interview in London just on the wrong week, that uh, the call of the lot policy was issued. Krista was um, interned um, in Port Erin. Now, I'm not quite sure whether she was 17, uh, but certainly she was a young girl, a young ballet dancer, and who, who was only in London for a week. And um, yeah, she, was, she ended up being interned and became a best friend of the host family. It seemed, I think, when Italy joined, um, everybody, uh, there was a bit of a panic and this is where the the um, title came, Colour the Lot, because there was a bit of a panic then just to, you know, to make sure everybody was, who who could have been, was was actually interned in the island, so. Well, Colour the Lot was actually determined at one of the first cabinet meetings that Churchill attended. And I think it was the 7th of May, but I'm not, without referring to our book, Friend or Foe, I was, and I would be unable to determine that date, but I feel certain it was the 7th of May. So it was very early on. Yes, it was earlier, I do believe. I can't remember the exact date, but it was certainly May. It was the end of the phony war, the invasion of the Low Countries, and then, of course, France and the imminent threat of invasion. That, that was it. That was it. It was that the imminent threat. Cut. I think it's really important, isn't it, to be aware of that broader context to, to all this, um, indeed. I mean, I met a, if I can just sort of intervene here, I met a lady, a woman not so very long ago, whose mother was only 16 and actually literally taken out of her classroom at St Paul's School, I think, quite unceremoniously by herself, 16. Mm. So, you know, well, well, so was Wanda's child. Um, I mean, Giza was taken out of her classroom, but she was... 14, but it quite suited Wanda. She wanted to get her children into the camp. And because her children were born in Britain, she couldn't get them into the camp because they were not classed as internees. And so um, she was desperate with her children left in London um, during the nightly bombing raids. Mm -hmm. And she was left in the Isle of Man fretting desperately. There are all these kind of uh, ironic twists, aren't they? Absolutely. And yeah. question, if I uh, may, and I think we're probably going to um, have to call it a day fairly soon because there might be drawing on from, from Julia Nelke. Uh, one of the things my mother mentioned was how there was no differentiation made between those Germans who were Nazi sympathisers and those like my mother who were political and anti-Nazi. She said how hard it was at the beginning that she was housed with Nazi sympathisers until the women sorted themselves out. Would anybody like to comment on that? It's a tricky... Well, actually, um, what we hear from, actually, Ruth Bouchard and I, the, there was a, a great deal of pressure on Dame Joanna to separate um, the sympathisers and the non-sympathisers, and indeed um, the Jewish people from others. And there was a kosher house set up, but the, um, the sympathisers... Um, the captains of the houses got together and they decided they actually thought it worked better as Je Dame Joanna had planned it with no separation. And it was Ira and Ruth who went to the commandant and supported her and said, no, we would prefer that people were not separated into groups. And I suppose in a way, 
you could think of that if there was a group of sympathizers all together nazi sympathizers goodness knows what they might have got up to and um, the one um, category of people that we haven't spoken about of course that were the greatest sympathizers were the british british fascists and we, we are still doing the research into the british fascist group who were more german sympathizers than german sympathizers if you wish um, this is david Wertheim. i think there's i think it's important to recognize that there was a complete spectrum uh, of uh, views in in the camp, ranging. I mean, obviously, ranging from the uh, from the uh, refugees, who were by far the majority, uh, at least in the early days of the camp, um, but also uh, amongst those who were not refugees, the Germans who had been living in in Britain for one reason or another, and that ranged from strong Nazi supporters to uh, those who were the so-called Reichstroy, who were um, pro-German, but not necessarily pro-Nazi. Yes, yes, that is important, David, because that, that's been a comment that's been made in many academic documents about the Reichstroy. I know I can't pronounce it properly, but, but you're correct that they had perhaps German family many like Dr. Friedland who did so much work in the camp but her parents were in Germany, elderly parents and she was desperate to get to Germany to look after them but she wasn't a Nazi supporter by any stretch of the imagination so yes there's a huge diverse range of people and I think Dame Joanna played it quite right by not separating people and it seemed to work out in the end to be perhaps um, a good judgment call for Dame Joanna. Thank you very much. I think it's really important isn't it to be aware of the kind of the nuance of the whole as you say the spectrum of, of backgrounds and experiences that were kind of gathered together by force of circumstance. I think probably we ought to call it a day there. I'd just like to sort of end with one last comment. The name of the Quakers has been brought up more than once and I hadn't realized that yes. Joanna herself was a Quaker and Bertha Bracey, interesting, wonderful woman. And I'd like to mention, if I may, that if you ever are in London and if you go to Friends House in Euston Road, the main uh, headquarters of the Quakers, um, there is on the kind of mezzanine as you go up rather grand staircase, there is a rather beautiful sculpture by um, a Holocaust survivor sculptor called Naomi Blake, whose daughter is very much around and telling her story to uh, members of the public as, as we speak, as it were. Um, uh, but it's actually dedicated to Bertha Bracey. And I think, you know, there are all these sort of very interesting connections and I mustn't go on uh, too long. But I do feel very strongly that the Quakers are the unsung heroes of the refugee story. And yeah. I, one thing I'd very much like to do at some point in the future is to pay proper tribute to them. And um, wonder, wonder, is that, yes, go on. Wanda, who, who in some academic papers was called the most notorious Nazi, we now know that was a misunderstanding for the lady that was the most notorious Nazi. But actually, Wanda's husband, Fritz, who was um, sent to the um, uh, labor camps in Can Canada, he, he was a, the patron of the, of the Friends Society. He was a Lutheran pastor, but very much um, a part of the of the Quaker understanding right interesting. yes you're you're quite right there was a huge Quaker Margaret Collier and as I say I only found out by chance that um, Dame Joanna attended the Friends Meeting House in Douglas so presumably she and she always dressed kind of like a, if you would imagine a Quaker and of course she went as a career into a a nursing service that only allowed unmarried women and widowed women in the service. So it was a kind of contemplative service when it first began. Thank you. Um, a few other comments here, perhaps, before we do draw to a close. Um, uh, Julian Elke telling everybody that her mother, whose story is very much intimately tied up with all this, as you've discovered, has actually written her story. Julia, has it been published or, or not? Julia, do, do feel free to unmute yourself and tell us more. It's, uh, hello, sorry, can you, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah, sorry, it has been published in German uh -huh. and I, I have an English copy, but it's, um, 
wasn't published in English. That's quite ironical, isn't it, that it's published yeah. in German, and not, not in English, but that's another, another discussion for another day, indeed. And Gabby Brown, who's already uh, chipped in, she says, I've got many uh, letters written by my aunt, which do tell their own story. And presumably, um, uh, the Russian Heritage Trust, am I right, would be very happy to hear from anybody who has things that they would like to either find out or to contribute to their researches. Well, Monica, I'd, I'd just like to say, I mean, I haven't said very much, um, we're actually in the process of, um, our local commissioners were about to demolish a little building, which was an old bus shelter. Mm -hmm. And we're in the process of actually refurbishing it to make it into a little mini exhibition centre, uh, a community hall, if you like, for um, people in, in the Port Aaron area. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping that people are going to come in and have a chat sometime, have a coffee and give us some more information, tell us their stories. Um, so people like Gabby and Julia and people, anybody like yourselves who, who have information that we could actually uh, include with our story because there's so much more we need to add to the uh, women's internment. Um, the, the Russian Heritage Trust have got various different titles, but the women's internment camp has, has continued because there is still so much to do and we don't want to finish it because we want to add and add to it. So if we would welcome anything that anybody would uh, give to us and keep in touch with us basically. And last but not least, a very, very practical question um, to the speakers. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Is there a contact email on the Russian Heritage Trust um, website, for example? There is. Yeah. There is, yes. Okay, the Russian Heritage Trust, you'll find it, no doubt, on courtesy of Google, um, an excellent resource with much to be further researched and discovered. So I think on that note, a very, very warm thank you to Doreen, to Ali, to Pam, and to David. And thank you all for being here so late in the evening. And um, I look forward to, to hearing more in, in, in due course. Uh, all the very best and uh, good night. Good night and thank you. Good night. Thank you, good night. Thank you for joining. Good night. <laughs> good night. There we are.